Have you ever noticed whenever you're you're looking for for something, and um, you know it might be a car, and that certain model of car that you're looking for, all of a sudden, every time you're driving down the road, you now see that model of car everywhere you turn. Right. It just it just pop. Oh, there it is. Well, there's one over there, I, and you never noticed that before. Well, it, something like that happened to me today during Rex's lesson, and I, it's just something I just had to bring out because it was it was really kind of a, a neat point for me, and I just got to share that with you. Um, and of course, my my system closed down, so it was not where exactly I wanted it to be. But let's see how smart I can be fighting a computer. Um, so there are certain things that um, that Rex said during his lesson today that I, I just thought was really kind of nice and really kind of interesting. You know, especially talking about those people that want to, you know. Talk about the Bible. The Bible's not right, and, and, and that it, it's false. Said we're actually going to cover some of that today, and so that was just kind of nifty. But something that I, I I didn't look at, and now I'm going to have to find a way to incorporate it into this lesson material, was that that this was uh, it was point number two. Whenever he was kind of going down that long little list, and it was that in the future the church will be evangelizing. Okay, and that was in Matthew 24, 14. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. And what that set my mind in motion was is that, okay, that means it's going to be taught right up until the end. So for it to be taught right up until the end, it has to be there to be taught. So it has to successfully be transmitted all the way until the end so that someone would have God's word to be able to evangelize it. So either one, because we got Jesus as a liar here, which then we might as well just throw the whole book out, or we have right here that it's going to be here. And right there, in just that one verse, you either have to accept it or not accept it. And it puts all the naysayers to rest. Just be quiet. Because if you want to say you can't believe it, you can't trust it, no. Because what I get from that right there, from that one verse, is there's enough there that we could be able to evangelize until the end of the time. So I just, I found that to be refreshing. So I, I found that uh, a big motivational thing. So, um, hey, segue. Textual variation and criticism. Now we're going to talk about this. This is going to be uh, hopefully fun for you. It was fun for me putting this one together. So it's going to be uh, good. Let's talk about last week, spreading God's word, talk about canonization. We're going to run through this real quick. Um, talk about the spread of God's word, the canonization, and there's how we got the Bible, this actual grouping of the 66 books. We talked about the goals and the three primary uh, criteria of why the books were accepted as being canon. Key thing I want you to remember is that it wasn't a group of people saying, yeah, we're going to pick this book, pick this book, pick this book. The books picked themselves by the quality of the books being inspired. It wasn't because, well, I like this book. I, I like what it says to me. It wasn't a matter of that. It was through the ratification of the meeting, the, cri or cri the criteria. Did it come from a prophet? Did it come from an apostle? Okay? And, you know, you we could expand some of this out. Was there, was there miraculous works that were involved? And as we go right on through, was it accepted by that first century church as being word? Was it known? That, did someone know? that the individual who wrote this actually was the transmitter of this, this material. Um, we talked about the Old Testament, New Testament canon. We talked about the time closed. Uh, we talked about uh, to who, whom uh, the scripture was quoted, going back basically to how the New Testament quotes so much from the Old Testament. Now, sometimes people want to say, you know, you have a lot of people, well, the, the God of the Old Testament is different than the God of the New Testament. Uh, you know, the, the God of the Old Testament, he was all about death and 
filling and all this other stuff and, and this God of the New Testament stuff. No, it's all the same. It's just that you had a God that had set parameters and there is going to be punishment. But the time of punishment for the New Testament is going to be at that time of judgment. And we talked again also about sources and commenter, commenters from their first century, second century, as they look toward that. Because who would have better knowledge on who actually um, wrote the, the, the word? Someone that's speaking today or someone that was speaking from back then as they were writing about it? Who would have better knowledge about the canonicity of the Hebrew letter? You know, some guy here that lives in Lithia, Florida, or someone that was actually there that was in, you know, that was uh, a Jew at that time that could attest to, yes, this is the canon as it was at that point in time. Um, we also talked about the Old Testament, New Testament, non-canon writing. This was the apocryphal and also the, the pseudepigraphia, uh, uh, grapha, excuse me, I threw an extra I in there. So, and these are just those additional writings that you have about that time. The ones that, you know, some, they were added at some point in time, but they weren't. And about what some of the early writers actually said about those of why they were not really ever considered within the canon. They, some of them are still considered contextually good because they do have some kind of historical value. And they might have some kind of, you know, um, uh, you know value in what they say about the times and about the people. Much like whenever we look... Um, Today, we have, you go on the internet, or you can go to, I mean, you can even go to, if you went to Fried Hardman um, Bookstore or Harding, some of these, you know, you know Church of Christ related um, uh, bookstores, you'll find books that are in there that are not biblical books. They, they might quote some, but it, it's people trying to explain or provide content about it. I mean, it's just like when Lex gave his lesson, and he's talking about how this person was figuring out what actually uh, was the telltale sign of someone that became a, a, a professional or a good musician. That's not canon, but it's something that gives input as to, hey, what you got to do is you got to make a lifelong commitment to Christ. And it's a marriage when you really get down to it. I mean, you might you could go even that, that, that further. So these are some of these writings that you have there, but they are not inspired works and then we and, and with that reference we even mentioned about the uh, the mentioning of the uh, the non-canon canon writing that's in Jude what he mentions about the assumption of Moses and he mentions about first Enoch okay so this week we're going to be talking about textual variation and criticism it's actually going to blend into next week too which is going to be our last week so um, and we'll talk a little bit on the way that we go, depending on how our time works. Watch for me at the day. All right, so how do we truly know that we have God's Word? You know, that's a question, and that's a question that's posed. You know, that, that's, that's what someone might say, an agnostic, or how do you really know that you've got God's Word? Did God give it to you? How do, how do you, know? how do you know that what's written is really and truly God's Word? And what they do with this is many sources use this to sow seeds of doubt and, and to undermine faith. And we've talked early on in our lesson work here that doubt is not necessarily a bad thing. Now, doubt is the opposite of what? Faith. Faith. Belief. Okay? And sometimes you need that because how do you strengthen your faith? I'm wrestling with, is it true? And what about this other viewpoint? And right. How can you answer but our challenges to your faith is how your faith grows. Whenever you want to get strong, do you just think, hey, I want to get strong, and instantly muscles pop out on you? It doesn't happen that way. Or do you have to go to the gym and actually put some work and effort and tear those muscles down so they're rebuilt back stronger? Resistance, right? Yeah, it's what it takes. It takes that effort. It takes something that's going against you, and it actually wears you down that builds you back up. But it's your resilience to do that. If you're unhealthy or if you're weak or if you're malnourished, will you be able to build back the muscle mass? Well, it's the same thing with faith. All right? And that's what we're, we're looking at here. 
But that's what a lot of people are banking on because, one, they're trying to make themselves feel good, right? So they're trying to destroy and undermine your faith. And, and what they're going to do is they're going to bring up errors and mistakes and all the things that are wrong and how it doesn't work with their worldview as opposed to a biblical worldview. Uh, they're only going to bring up the conspiracies and how uh, this was all evilness and it was all about controlling people. And, and these are all that they want to bring to you. But it's kind of interesting that the same people that talk about controlling people are also still trying to control the way that you think. Have you ever noticed that? I mean, even with our political system, it's all about, hey, I want to control you because I want you to vote for me. That's what it's down to. And they get angry if you don't agree with Oh, absolutely. You can believe whatever you want to believe. Don't you dare disagree with me. Oh, what kind of thought pattern is that? It, it makes absolutely no sense. And what we're talking about is we're talking about the inward battle of belief. Not necessarily the battle against someone else, but it's the battle of belief that's inside. It's the one in which you're, you're weighing and you're balancing because we're all logical, reasoning creatures that God made that way. We also have free will and free thinking because God wants you to love him because you want to love him, not because he said you will love me or he's just made it that you only have one choice. Yeah. I love God. Why? What other choice do I have? No, it's a conscious choice on it. Different people can review or research the same evidence, the same evidence, and draw different conclusions. What do you all see? <laughs> okay, that go platypus. Okay, what else? What What do you see? You see a rabbit? It could, it could, it could be. Yeah, I thought you said it's both. So it's a, oh, it's both. So some see a duck. It could be. Some see a rabbit, right? So the point is, is that, it, it, am I going up there and changing the picture on you? No. No, but we're seeing the same thing, but you can see two different things is the point. That, let's do another one here. What do y'all see? Oh, oh, so you see the both. See, yeah, the it's two. She sees the horse first. I see the bullfrog. First. Yeah. Oh yeah. Can I see the bullfrog? Uh, uh, what, what if I what if I do this? Does that that, that, that one looks like the horse? Yeah. So so what I'm saying is that and, and this one's saying people can look at the same. It's one of those things. You know, if I, I should, probably should put that up there. If I had a cup that was half full oh, yeah, or half empty, that's the way people are going to see it, right? One of the problems with the Bible is that so many people go into it, really reading it yeah, yeah. with their mind already made up, trying to find what they're looking for. Reading for justification. Right. This is what I think, and I'm going to show you where it is. It said, let the scriptures tell you what it says. Right? Sometimes people can say something is there when it really isn't. Oh, you, yeah, you can see it. You can see a, a, a face. Yes. But is there a face there? No, it's a tree It's just tree limbs. But some people, no, there's a face there. Oh, well, kind of like oh look, it's a rabbit. It's a cloud. How do you get a rabbit out of there? Okay, so, but, but you see what I'm saying? And, and the th same thing happens whenever people are looking at the scripture. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. In Lester's, um, Lester Greer's classes, one of the things that she pointed out that a lot of people hadn't noticed, and I hadn't, was it was Paul saying, I am saying this, not I'm saying what God said. Yeah. Right. And we overlook the fact that Paul said it was him yeah. in his words, not God's words. That part, in yeah, several it's kind of like the idea that sometimes we do traditions <coughs> to help support what we're actually told to do, but that tradition is just a tradition that doesn't become the rule of, upon itself. And one of the things that Lester does in her class that I think is very, very good, she'll say, This is my opinion, instead of that, this is what it says. That's kind of like when I say first Benjamin or <laughs> yeah. or 
understand that. <laughs> I understood. Yes, ma'am. Our minds are designed for pattern recognition. That's yeah. why we see these things, we see faces where there aren't any faces. Where right. our minds are or, exposed. Or we want to think a certain way, therefore we see that pattern yeah. that way. Mm -hmm. In other words, if we want to think a person is evil, we will still look for every single way to prove our point that that person is evil. To justify what our thought is. Sad to say, it's what we do. Why? Well, part of it is actually a defensive mechanism, believe it or not. You get a gut feel of something, you don't know why. It could be something from the past. It could be because of a past incident that a person survived. You know, it could be a situation that a smell. I'll give you a perfect example. Um, back in Hawaii, I I got uh, food poisoning off of sweet and sour pork. Tell you what, I could not even think of sweet and sour pork. I could not even stand the smell of it. And it took me some 12 or so years before I could ever get myself to turn around and actually try a piece of the game. Now, does that mean all sweet and sour porn was bad? But that was my body's reaction to it. And sometimes that what happens to people, okay? You know, and that's the reason why there, there's that, you know, some things happen on a psychological level. So there, there's an aspect to that, okay? And people will only see what they want to see or, you know, how they're conditioned to see it, okay? We're going to talk about a little copyist exercise. Here's what I want you to do. All right? Take out your 3 by 5 card. I want you to write a random verse from your Bible. Okay? And what I want you to do with this is include the book, chapter, and verse in the upper left-hand column. Now, do, don't go with, like, Jesus wept. Okay? <laughs> but don't think, hey, I'm going to write, you know, the, the 119th Psalm either. Okay? I, don't, I didn't give you enough room for that. Okay? And include the version of the Bible that you're writing from. Okay? Now, I'm not asking you to do this from memory, but if you want to do it from memory, that's fine. Um, that's kind of up to you. And what, what you should have is something that looks kind of like this. All right? So, let's go ahead and just take a, a minute or two and do this. And don't worry, you're not going to be turning these in, so. But I do want you to do it. So, look it up or look from memory? If you want to go from memory, that's fine. What y'all are being right now is you're being scribes or copyists. That's what you're doing right now. What's that? We're all wrapping that up. But one of the things I want you to point out, here's my verse that I've got up here in John 7, uh, 39. Um, and sometimes you'll have this within your Bible. If you notice in this one here, but this he said in reference to the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive, for the Spirit was not yet given. But notice the word given up there. Notice that it's got a different little font characteristic. It's italicized. Okay. Uh, because Jesus was not yet glorified. A lot of times in your Bibles, they will have a little note, or sometimes they'll put something in parentheses, they'll put something in italics, 
because what they're doing is they're showing you that by some of the original manuscripts, that word was not in there, but other ones, that word was added. So they're showing a difference within the manuscripts. So that's just something I'm kind of cluing you in on right there. Pretty good. I'm going to move on to the next slide. We can continue finishing up. We'll, we'll be getting into this in, in a little bit. Let's start talking a little bit about textual uh, criticism. Now, mistakes happen. I've already kind of brought out in, in earlier classes about how that, um, you know, I even talked about how that, you know, that we, in, the, in the, the, the worship service, there were a couple of times that. Um, so scripture was used out of context. I even talked about how that in the preparation of this class here, I've had multiple mistakes in either my PowerPoint slides or where I've left out a word or, or I made something plural when it should have been. I didn't have subject verb agreement. So things like that. So we're human, right? So mistakes happen, right? Problems arise in writing where the process is by hand, print, or digital. Do you know about how many mistakes were in the first King James Version Bible when it hit, got off the press from, from, from Gutenberg? There were about 400. Okay. Wow. And so fun. what happened? A couple of years. They reprinted, you know, a second edition to make uh, correct those mistakes. We as imperfect humans have the potential to make errors and mistakes. Why? Because we're human. Mm -hmm. All right. Even with today's technology, we're not exempt from misprints, okay? All right? I mean, even spell check doesn't really help us out sometimes. <coughs> but sometimes you'll talk into your phone, and what comes out on the other end, you're like going, that's not what I meant. <laughs> All right. The same as to be said, the past copies or scribes, guess what? They were human, too, okay? Now, they had a lot of rigor, especially the ones back with the Old Testament canon, you know, they had a very rigid system. We will know the middle letter. We will know the middle of the Old Testament canon. We will know exactly how many words are supposed to be on this page. And they had a process for doing it. Not so much necessarily for the New Testament. All right? That might put a little scare into you. But we'll never cover that. The presence of these errors and mistakes has given rise to a highly advanced science referred to as textual criticism. All right? Now, criticism is always bad, right? No, we just think it's bad. Okay. While textual criticism is a science, there's also an art to it as well. Um, the text critics uh, seek, by comparison and study of all the available evidence to recover the exact words of the author's original composition. And this is why, because we don't have the original autographs. So we have to do a comparison to try to figure out what's going on. That's the good thing about all having so many Greek manuscripts. Way more than what we have in the Old Testament, okay? Now, errors in the Bible, right? But then I say that the Bible was an error? Free from error? Hmm. What I said was the Bible is an error, free from error, meaning it is without error or fault in all of its teaching. Okay? So I want to make sure we're clear on that. Because when we're talking about the errors, the errors are between the manuscripts. Because there's actually families of manuscripts. You've got the Byzantine, when you look into the big breakdowns of them, you've got the Byzantine, you've got the uh, Alexandrian, and then you have the Western manuscripts if you want to group them into families like that. And they're kind of how they were copied and, and how they were kind of uh, um, collated as for the copies of the copies of the copies. Because that's what we have is we've got copies, right? So in, this is the where you got to say to the Christian, you got to armor up. Okay? you got to get that shield of faith up. Alright? This is, this is where people if you're, if you're weak... You're going to be like, oh no, it, it can't be right. 
we can't trust the Bible, might as well become an atheist or agnostic. All right. You got to watch the wording, okay? Faith is a requirement, a statement I've used quite often in, in this, uh, this class. Textual criticism. A field of study that assesses the body of evidence to discover the most authentic texts of the scriptures. And when it does this, it goes back and compares all of these manuscripts. Okay? The reason we, we don't have the original autographs of any Bible book, why? They got worn over time. They weren't made out of some kind of, you know, you know, titanium grade impervious material. They, they didn't have that capability. And if they made something like that, they would have trouble writing on it at that point in time, too. Uh, they didn't have laser engraving back then. Yes, sir. The problem is, if we had the original, we would worship it. <laughs> That's a very good point. Yeah. I mean, look what we do with antiquity, our pictures, our, those things like that. We have thousands of manuscript copies, though, and where are those locked away in? They're locked away in museums or such as that. And there's some that are locked so deep in the Vatican, they don't allow anyone into, except for periodically to come and review it. So there are probably still copies that are out there. It's kind of very, it's, it's, it's interesting. All right. Um, but, you know, we have copies, fragments, lectionaries, patristic writings, quotations, translations. There are so many fragments or copies that are out there. It's amazing. The intent of textual criticism is through the study of the many thousand ancient manuscripts with the purpose to ascertain the original text of that, of the New Testament, see, right there, the name says, of the New Testament authors that they dutifully penned under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Man, I got, I got two mistakes. Thank you, babe. Thank you for keeping me humble. <laughs> That's why I married you. All right. This criticism is referred to as lower criticism, okay? And which is concerned only with the form of words, which obviously I'm struggling with today. Um, higher criticism actually devotes it, and this is more like whenever we're, we're doing, hey, we're going to do a topical study or we're doing a, book, a study on this book, in which it devotes itself to the study of authorship, the day of composition, and the historical value of that book. Fundamental rules for textual criticism, and this kind of goes into the canon, remember that measuring stick, shall we say. Um, they're not hard, fast rules, and this is where that art comes in, where you've got to kind of, kind of look at it, because what you're doing is you're, you're, you're looking at the, the weight of the material, not necessarily the number of it. Uh, the general principles to guide and stabilize the textual critic. The more difficult text is preferred. Now you might go, why would you think that the more difficult text is preferred? Well, the things, have you ever read Shakespeare? It's easy reading, right? Mm -hmm. You're kind of going, uh, where's the cliff notes? So, but the cliff notes might leave something else as it, it's brought up to a, a more modern English. Well, guess what? As that Quinny Greek was adjusting, it would get more modern too. As the scribes were writing, sometimes they would go like, well, hey, let me put this in, in tennis shoes. Well, they probably didn't have tennis shoes back then, but in, in easier walking sandals so that it might be a little bit better understood by the church in the fourth century or fifth century. Yes, what? An example might be Jonah and the whale. Uh -oh. <laughs> right, instead of the fish. You know, but the thing is, is did they have a word for well back then? So there's so many different little things to look at within this. And that's why the more difficult text is preferred, because that might get closer to what the actual apostle wrote. All right? The quality of the, the textual witness is more important than the quantity, because a lot of times copies were made, and how the copies were made. You might have had someone that, what did we do right here? I had you all write individually, but there was a place called a scriptorium, and a scriptorium was a place where you would all sit around, and then I would get up, and I would read you the word, and then you're writing down as I would read the word, so that way we could, from one book, I could then have 18 or so copies being made, okay? In parallel text, different readings are usually preferred. Let me explain this to you especially in the Gospels. In the Gospels, 
you have different views of the same event. Now, as a person that has done investigations, and Dwight, I'm pretty sure you're right there with me, your witnesses, you will get different stories. Because everyone has their different viewpoint. It's just the way it is. Because everyone sees it from their point of view. Everyone turned to look after the sound of the crash or whatever like, whatever happened. It's just the way it goes. And that's and you have to go and you have to put the puzzle together. And that's what they do. If if everyone that saw the event is saying the exact same story, what do you think? Something's wrong. Something's wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Made up their stories together. And sometimes what happened is you had scribes because they knew and they're copying so much, sometimes they might be writing in John, and they're writing John, but they remember, oh, yeah, well, this is what Matthew said. Let me give you a perfect example. You know, I'll, I'll get to you. I'll. You already said it. <laughs> okay. Love the Lord thy God with all thy and strength. Okay. Now, if you look at it, one scripture only lists three of those. Another scripture lists four. It would be very easy for someone writing the one and three to go ahead and throw in that straight also. You see what I'm saying? It's, it's that easy. But someone wants to say, well, well, they said only three and they said four. It's wrong. Really? Okay. Let's move on. Let's do an example here. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother without cause will be liable to judgment. And I've got a whole little thing that we could go we could go on this one here and go back to writers from the, 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 the third and fourth century and the fifth century, what they wrote about this on whether without cause was actually in there. And there's different viewpoints on it. What I'm just going to say is this is one of those things that that brings into a deliberation because, well, hmm, here we have the Sermon on the Mount. It's saying, angry with his brother. Let's take it out. Angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. So if you're angry, just being angry is wrong. So the idea is to not be angry. Well, there's many different ways you look at this. Tell me, the fruit of the Spirit, where is anger? Not in there. Yeah. Now, if you're angry with your brother, is that probably going to cause you to uh, do something? Bad feelings? Maybe in the treatment of it? Now, what does Paul say about anger? Just be angry, but do not sin. But do not sin. Because what is anger? Let's, let's get right down to it. What is anger? It's an emotion. It's a reaction. Does Paul say, don't be angry? No. Is Jesus saying, don't be angry here? Right? Now, this idea of without cause, some believe that it was added in there to soften it a little bit because some people believe that there is a righteous anger. Now, where do they get this from? How did Jesus feel about those people that were in the uh, temple? People say that you always must turn the other cheek, and yet in John, where he's before the high priest, the servant of the high priest slaps him, he does not turn the other cheek. In fact, he starts verbally retaliating immediately. Is there a righteous anger? Yes. Can you have an anger but still operate in love? Mm -hmm. Now, are we supposed to hate? Are we? Are we supposed to hate the things that God hates? See, this is where you can't pull one scripture out. You have to look at the whole bounty and understand there's balance within here. And then that's what has to be looked at. This is this is taking and doing that textual criticism and looking at it and saying, okay, well, what was why was this in here? Is someone trying to bring in a point? Are they trying to explain something? 
Was it in the original? Well, it looks like it might not have been in the original, but it was put in probably around the second century. That is an aspect of it. But what they do in our Bibles is they'll put this in here to let you know that because the Bible is actually what we do with our Bibles. It's actually a compilation. It tries to give you enough right there so that you have the understanding that, hey, this is what the Word says, but some of the extant manuscripts also include this, just so that you have knowledge, okay, so that you understand. But we also understand what's the guiding principle that we're supposed to have when you look and you do a step back and you're looking at the Sermon on the Mount. Everything should go together, otherwise it's a misunderstanding. Right. Yeah, we're talking about, the, the key thing is love, right? Love and anger, you're, you're going to you're going to get angry. Some things are going to set you off. It's an emotional reaction. And guess what? God made us to be emotional creatures, but not to act out of anger. Because you know something? It took Jesus some time to braid a whip. Trust me, did Jesus have the power to cleanse that temple right then and there? No, he took some time. He took some effort. Just some thoughts, all right? And I'm probably just as wrong as the next person because I'm human, okay? Let's talk some, about some textual variation. So, slowing down, okay? Here we have this, this great man, Bart D. Ehrman, okay? R. Bart D. Ehrman, as in error, man. But um, one, one writer wrote about this guy saying that this man is probably single-handedly um, more responsible for, for for turning people into atheists than anyone else. Uh, just because, I mean, the thing is, just, it, it, it's sad because some people are so buttery smooth in their delivery. Why is it that some of the worst songs on the radio are the ones that are the most catchy? It, it, it's amazing. All right. There are more variations among our manuscript scripts than there are words in the New Testament. Our manuscripts are full of mistakes. Not only do we not have the originals, we don't have the first copies of the originals. Now, I'm going to stop right here. Because i got to bring this out. If we don't have the first copies of the original, how do you really justify that there's so many mistakes? The only way that you can say that is you're looking at the manuscripts themselves and you're seeing that this one doesn't say exactly the same thing as this one. So let's think about that. Let's, let's, be, let's be a little smarter using common sense than the smart guy with the PhD here that's leading people astray. Okay? But sometimes what it really takes is just sit back and being the logical human beings that God made us to be and not being sheep, following just because, oh my goodness, all right? This is what I'm saying, armor up. We don't even have copies of the copies of the originals. What we have are copies made later, much later. And these copies all differ in so many places that we don't even know how many differences there are. Now, let's go back to what I read at the very beginning, which we took from Rex's lesson. I don't know about you, but my God is an all-powerful God. My God wants a relationship with us. He's going to make sure we got his word. And he's going to make sure there's enough that he can have that relationship because that's what he wants. So where am I going to put my trust? God or in this guy? He might be smart and, and he, is, he is a premier, believe it or not, sexual critic. But I think he saw the duck instead of the bunny. Mm -hmm. And that's the way he's seen it. And he's definitely cup is half empty. Okay. And I think the other thing is, because he's a very well-known critic, uh, um, by mistakes you'd also have to investigate what he means. Because if there are mistakes, full of mistakes in error or in doctrine, because... Uh, I can misspell the word Jerusalem, yeah. or I can teach that Jesus never, the, the, you know, 
walk into Jerusalem. I mean, there's a big difference in this. What what is the mistake yeah. that I you know? There's something that just jumps out at me about this. How does he know? Does he have the original? How do you say there's so many errors when you don't know what the original said? Maybe he has special knowledge. And you also got words change based upon location and based over time. For example, in America, you say somebody's piss, they're making fists and coming after you. I guess in Australia, you say somebody's piss, piss. He's had too many beers. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, did, did, uh, co- probably a bad example, but it's like... No, it, which, it, it, which, it, it actually has merit. Your example has that. Which, bad. you know, so-and-so was pissed. Well, does that mean he was angry or does that mean he was drunk? Yeah, it, it's and just... so which is the mistake? Hey, that's bad. <laughs> are, are you saying that that's bad or are you saying that's bad as in that's bad? <laughs> Which one are you saying? You know, it, it's kind of like the, in, in, with the Rangers. Hua, hua, hua. Each one of those means four different things. Another Ranger would know exactly what I was saying. Y'all are going like, is he speaking in tongues? <laughs> I had a good experience, Mike. The best thing I was talking, I said, Oh, I really screwed up. She got so upset with me, she could not believe that I said that. She was just horrified that I said that. She had an entirely different meaning to screw up that I never heard of in my life. <laughs> it's, a, it's amazing. Y'all ready to check your copies to exercise here? All right. Here's some questions for you. All right. Did you copy it correctly? Think so. Okay. Mm-hmm. Did you feel you had a certain responsibility in how you copied the verse? I mean, you're copying the word of God. Don't you feel like you need to copy it right? Yeah. In the comments? Of course. Our Bible said punctuation. That wasn't necessarily true back then. But the point is, is that, see, this is what people want to do. They want to act like the scribes are a bunch of, you know, hey, we're out here. Hey, let's, you know, what are we doing this weekend? Hey, why don't we just go ahead and, you know, and write down, you know, what Paul said at the end of the day. This was the word of God. This came from an apostle. That guy that just got bit bit by that, that <coughs> snake and he's still alive. You know, I mean, this is what was going on. So don't you think they kind of gave a little bit of like, let's get this right because we want to get this. So those Bereans could actually be searching and saying, yes, this is right. But but we want to give this idea today that, oh, man, they're just, that's the way we treat the word. We want to use our own experiences in the way that we might treat the Bible. That's not the way you did it back then. Now, a person that had no care about the Bible, if you told them, hey, guys, today in class, we're going to copy a verse of Scripture, you'd have people wrong. You see what I'm saying? So there's a difference. Now, I want you to feel that. Could you have written something else? In other words, could you have changed some words if you wanted to? Okay. Did you feel the Holy Spirit guide you through inspiration? Did you? Huh? I mean, because if the Holy Spirit guided you, then you probably couldn't have changed something then. Because the Holy Spirit would be making sure that you did exactly the right thing. My point is this. The inspired word was that autograph. We have copies of copies. You understand what I'm saying? Now, the idea is through textual criticism, what we're trying to do is get what the apostles originally wrote. Do you understand? Uh, I'm trying to bring up the point. But see, this is what happens when people are going like, well, how do you, well, so do what I actually have? What I have is a translation of the copies of the inspired, of the inspired word. And yeah, we've had to make some adjustments, but it's through the power and the grace of God to make sure, going back to what we read at the very beginning from Rex's lesson there, that we have what we need. And this is where people, they, they, they want to leave God out of it. 
They don't understand that God is working every day around us. God is here. God is there, and the Holy Spirit is here, making sure that our back is. Is He training us into robots? If He did that, then what happens to free will? There's a reason why. This is the this is the reason why it's faith, and not I have knowledge. I have special knowledge, like the Gnostics would say. And I want you to have an understanding of what this is. But I also want you to look at this. If we kind of went around, and we don't have time to do this, so I'm going to do this, and then we're going to cut it short for the day, and then we'll go into the rest of it next Sunday, is, and I'm just going to do this just, and what it's going to do is you can cross-check with someone, um, or else what you can do is just say, hey, pull out your version. Let me see what your version says on this. But what I'm going to show you is this. Notice the difference between this. Now, this is the New American Standard. Bible, and this is the New American Standard Bible of 1995. Notice what the second one says. Now, I read the first one earlier, but this he spoke of the Spirit. Notice the difference between, but this he said in reference to the Spirit. Now, these are both from the same manuscript, but it's been changed English-wise. So the translation is different. It's made so that it can hopefully be better understood English with with keeping the same meaning and teaching. Remember what I wrote back there about it's the teaching that is remaining the same. It's that inspired teaching, not the inspired word for word. Okay, see that's what a lot of people want to do. It's like I want to have a word for word. I tell you what, if we, if we translated word for word from the Greek, you would really be rubbing your heads and trying to figure it out. Because we'd all have to then become Greek scholars to where we are conversant in Quinny Greek to be able to say, okay, now, now I understand what you're doing. Yes, sir. Um, King James Version, that scripture is in parentheses, the whole thing. Going back to earlier point about how they put things in there to set it out to see what it was. Right, because, there was a, because there's been something that was put in there and it's mainly that, that word given. That's in there because what happened is the actual translation said that the spirit was not yet. But the thing is, is whether they're coming, well, what does that mean to say the spirit is not yet? Not yet been born, not yet arrived, not yet what? So what happened was it was added in the word given to understand that the spirit was not yet given. Why? Because Jesus, in whatever you read and understand it, Jesus said that I am going to send a comforter. All right. So when Jesus was to leave and he was going to ascend, he was going to have a comforter. And that comforter was the Holy Spirit. So that, that's what this goes back to. How about we go to uh, one I've never used before. I just picked it out at random here. This is the world uh, English here. This is what Jesus meant. Not what he said, not what he spoke, but what he meant. Those who believe in him would receive the Spirit. At the time, no one had received the Holy Spirit because Jesus had not yet been lifted to heaven. Okay, so you can see how the English, just the English is different. Well, that happened also as Greek was being copied too, because you'd have copyists that would try to help that out. Time check now. Okay, and with that, we're going to include this. We're going to go into the rest of um, the variations. Keep those cards for next week, because I might have a follow-on assignment afterwards with that one. If not... Um, and then what we're going to do is we're going to talk more about textual variation, and then probably what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you some illustrations, and we'll actually pull out some and show you some of the differences, and I'll show you some of the manuscripts that actually support one way and versus the other, and there's some good news to this also when we get into it. All right? Thank you. Thank you.